So, um, yeah, from one very large established producer to a, a small new producer, um, Vertigo is a, a new company, a relative new company we set up around a year ago from our site um, just beside Newborough, north of Aberdeen. Um, we have been growing indoors for, for that period and gradually forming our plans for what we're going to do next. So the business came from um, looking at our existing farm. Uh, we have an arable farm um, of about um, 300 acres, uh, most of which does traditional Aberdeenshire crops, um, lots of barley, some rye, um, crops that go for brewing and distilling and, uh, and a few other things as well. But we looked at the farm and we looked at the, uh, the future of farming in Aberdeenshire, um, how we could use our land more productively and in a more, uh, more efficient way. Um, and we started talking a few years ago about growing indoors to make, uh, you know, turn the, the downsides of being in Aberdeenshire on their heads. So the, um, uh, the short days in winter and the, uh, the long cold winters, we thought, how do we do something different here where rather than just growing crops from April to September, we're doing something a bit more productive. Um, so we set up Vertigo and we've been growing crops indoors, having looked at various other systems and um, looking at the, um, the kind of triple bottom line, we kind of took our own uh, little spin on that with uh, our plants, people, planet tagline. Um, so we are um, the founders and the investors in the company, we're all really passionate about really good quality food and drink. Um, creating excellent, excellent food locally in Aberdeenshire, as a lot of other companies do. And um, we're trying to develop a, um, a small company with people that are really enthused in the business and really excited about what they do. And obviously one of the, one of the big drivers for, for the company as well is being planet positive and, and trying to grow in a, in a greener, more efficient way, which is obviously the, the focus for this evening. Um, so for those of you who haven't Come across vertical farming before. Um, it, um, it can take many different forms, um, or some slightly different forms, but a kind of a couple of key features. Generally, all grown indoors, normally with art, completely artificial light, so um, no external light. Um, generally, very energy efficient because, uh, as opposed to polytunnels where you lose a lot of heat, or greenhouses where you know have the same issues. Um, we have a completely insulated sealed system uh, and the benefits of that is that we're not at the mercy of the weather um, and we can grow crops all year round. What we can grow in the summer it grows exactly the same in the winter, uh, the same quality, same fl flavour profile uh, and the same yield um, and somewhere like Aberdeenshire I mean, that's a real, a real benefit. Um, and there's some other benefits there as well. We can, because we're a completely closed system, um, we don't have lots of pests, and obviously, therefore, we don't need to spray any pesticides at all on any of our crops. So our, our inputs are um, uh, significantly less, and there's some uh, there's some climate benefits to that as well. Um, so our current crop mix, um, we are focused on what's probably best summarised as herbs and leafy greens. So we do. Um, uh, we do a lot of basil for a couple of local businesses. Uh, we've been growing rocket. Um, we've done a few other trials of some interesting things like strawberries indoors, which we can do, as I say, in, in January. So it was really exciting. Harvesting strawberries by hand in January and February last year was, uh, was quite interesting. Um, at the moment, we've got a few other things in. We've got some edible flowers, which we're trialing. Um, and the system is very customizable. So we can do- Trialing completely different things with it and um, and move into completely different um, different types of plants but naturally it fits really well with things that have, that would grow within a month or so um, and are harvested when they're still relatively small that makes best use of our space. Um, so looking at food generally and one of the challenges we think we can solve by, by growing indoors um, there's a couple of stats here I've pulled out on, on how the UK consumes food um, only, and I find some of this quite surprising, only 55% um, of the food that we eat is produced within the UK. Um, and about 80% of our fruits and veg is imported as well, which is a staggering number, um, to consider the food miles that goes into that. Um, and touching on Jerry's cows earlier, um, UK farming has a fairly significant um, carbon footprint itself as well. So when you add those two factors together, you can see there's an opportunity to do things in a slightly different way and maybe make some, uh, some savings in terms of the carbon footprint of the food that we eat. Um, and we feel that we are 
um, we're kind of should be pushing it an open door with consumers here as well. Um, put a stat there that 88% um, of consumers are regularly taking environmental action. Um, this was a this was a survey focused primarily on, on food habits. And so we see that when people are looking in their supermarket to, to buy food, they are actually already thinking about where it comes from, how it gets there. Um, so we think there's an opportunity there to work with consumers and to, to satisfy that demand. Because at the same time, consumers nowadays really expect to be able to eat the same produce all year round. I don't think people eat quite as seasonally as they used to. So now, going back to our strawberry example, people, people do expect to be able to eat strawberries in, in January or in July. And if they can't get locally grown produce in, in uh, at certain times of the year, then they'll just look for an imported equivalent instead. So um, as, as I've noted there, the, the opportunity that we see is, um, although we have a short growing season, the last couple of years have highlighted the problems of long supply chains or the difficulties of importing crops. And we think we're well positioned to, to do something locally, um, which can solve some of those issues and um, have some climate benefits as well. So when we've set up the business, um, right from the outset, um, we were looking at our carbon footprint, um, how we were going to do things differently. And we really see that one of our key, um, one of our key selling points really is um, the carbon footprint of our crops when we're comparing to other crops. So um, we, uh, we looked at the carbon trusts um, definitions of being carbon neutral and how we achieve net zero and started to apply that to each of the, the inputs into our business. So, um, Obviously, with scope one um, parts are, are fairly simple. Um, we um, we don't have really have much on or any on-site fuel. Um, we will have a limited footprint from delivery, which I'll come back to later on. Um, and from scope two, our emissions for our system are really just from electricity. So we don't have any heat at all in our system because it's built to uh, an insulated standard. Um, we all the heat that we need comes from the LED lights. So we don't have any gas at all. So the carbon footprint in that sense is quite low. And we're quite fortunate that um, Scotland's grid energy is quite green. Obviously that's not a, com a complete answer. So I'll come back to that point as well. So our scope two, we're primarily focused on, on electricity and working at the carbon footprint of that. Um, scope three is where things then get a bit trickier. So that's looking at um, the other inputs into your, uh, into your product. Um, and then what happens for your product through to the end of life. So for us, another advantage, as, uh, as I touched on, is that um, the inputs for an indoor um, vertical farming system are very low. We don't have any pesticides. Um, we, um, we harvest all of our rainwater from the roof of the facility um, and um, our other um, fertilizer inputs and so on are far lower than um, you would have in a normal field grown crops. And I'll come back to that in a, a second as well. So um, whilst to be carbon neutral under the carbon trust definition means that you only have to focus on scopes one and two. Um, we are we think it's sensible to, to focus on scope three from the outset to make sure that we're making the right decisions for the business early on and, um, and make sure that our inputs are as low as possible as we go forward. So um, I've pulled out a couple of areas that we are, are focusing on. Um, our delivery, for example, at the moment we're growing from a very small um, sort of test facility just while we finish off building our, our new facility. Um, and at the moment we are um, delivering our crops locally. Our furthest delivery is into Aberdeen, which is about 50 miles. And we're doing that just, um, just using cars at the moment. So there's definitely a carbon footprint there. We can't avoid that. And we've got to acknowledge that. At the moment, we are analysing what our delivery pattern will be as we scale up over the next couple of months. The long-term plan is that once we've established what our requirement is for delivery, then we'll hopefully have, uh, have an electric van at that point. And if we can make that as efficient as possible, um, then hopefully we can have a really low food miles for, for our local deliveries. On our inputs, um, I've touched on, um, I've touched on the, uh, the nutrients we put in, which are a tiny amount. The way the system works is that um, the Harvested rainwater from the roof of our facility goes to the holding tank. We add a tiny amount of nutrients, which goes through um, the tree which the plants sit in. The plants pick up what they need, and whatever then flushes back out of that tree goes back through a, a cyclical system and is stored again. So any nutrients which aren't picked up by plants um, then uh, just get used for the next cycle when we water the, the, that tree of plants again 24 hours or, or 18 hours later. So our inputs in that sense are, are minimal. Um, grow media is is one of the other inputs where obviously we have 
are to support the plant somehow in its tray. So at the moment we're using coco coir um, because it's a complete, completely inert material, so it doesn't have any risk of bringing bacteria or any other plant diseases into our facility. Um, that's one of the areas that we uh, were monitoring at the moment. So coco coir obviously isn't produced in, in Scotland, it's definitely not warm enough for coconuts here. So we have to import that. And obviously there's a, there's a, um, there's a carbon footprint of, of shipping coco coir around the world. As a base product, the carbon footprint of that is, is very low because obviously we're, we're growing things in trees, taking what's essentially a waste product from coconuts and then using it. But we've still got to get that from halfway around the world to Scotland. So one of the things that we'll be looking at in a lot more detail over the next couple of months as we move into our slightly bigger facility is whether we can do something um, using other grow media on a slightly different, um, which has a, a lower carbon footprint still and can be produced more locally. Um, we're working on our farm, for example, with about 10 other farmers in Scotland to grow hemp in the field, which is a really interesting crop because hemp mats could work perfectly if we can get the product right for supporting seeds and therefore plants in our facility. Um, so that's the kind of thing that if, you could, if you're able to do that locally, you can see how you can have a complete system of growing, growing hemp in your field to make it into a product that can support the plants and then your used grow media when you're finished can just be cut, can be chopped up and put back into the fields and break down there again. So you have a, uh, an example of a really good system. Um, I've also I've included a worm here as well to illustrate what we can do with some of our current waste. Um, we're working with, um, with Newborough Worms and Scott Baxter, who I'm sure some of you will know, um, to break down um, our cocoa coir and our plant roots. So the waste, the waste product that comes out when we harvest our plants, there's not a huge amount that gets taken out, but we've got essentially the roots of the plant. Um, at the moment, we are putting those into a big tub. We get some worms uh, from Scott and we're breaking that down on farm. And that's something that can be then used as a compost, either for gardeners or in our case, um, as we have a little bit more scale, that's something that we can put back into our, our, our fields and can then help our, our barley and our other crops grow as well. And I've included also at the bottom there, um, the key input, and we definitely can't ignore that, is our, is our energy. So I'll come on to that in a bit more detail. Um, just pulling out a couple of other things, some of these I've covered already. Um, although, um, although we could just use mains water for growing, we've elected to use harvested rainwater. So all of the water which our crops grow in comes from the roof of the facility. Um, I worked out what the, um, the CO2 saving of doing that would be, and it's pretty minimal because, they, because water in, uh, obviously in Scotland doesn't have a huge carbon footprint, but there are other environmental benefits there as well. We're not putting so much pressure on the grid. Uh, on the on the water system um, and uh, you know I think I still think it's, it's the right thing to do um, we've already covered the crop nutrients and so on as well um, one of the other advantages of our our system is because we have a very short turnaround from planting our crop through to harvesting we can be a lot more accurate in what we what we grow and when we grow it so we can work with our customers um, and they can tell us if they need a crop and because they're expanding, they need more of a certain product in a couple of months time. Um, because we can grow most of our crops in about 30 days, we can forecast that really accurately, which has a huge benefit in terms of food waste. So what we grow, we think we should be able to sell virtually all of it. Um, and then any, if there are any small surpluses and we're we'll working with local food banks as well, just to get, you know, to make best use of, of all of our produce. So energy. Um, as I said earlier, we have a really high, high specification insulated building. And we looked at um, building the facility within an existing shed, but we just didn't have the, the space to build the way we needed to. So instead we have 100 mil thick panels on our system. And that means that although the LED lights are very efficient, the, lit, the small amount of waste energy that comes out of them as heat is enough to keep the, uh, the building at the kind of ambient 20, 23, 24 degrees that we need. Um, so we don't need to put any heating in at all. If anything, we need a little bit of cooling. Um, so we have a, a, a chiller plant, which is quite efficient. And we've analyzed that as, as, in the same way as Jerry has. We've looked at the refrigerant gases uh, in the products which were being suggested to us. We've made some changes there to, be, uh, to make sure that we're using our appropriate um, gases there as well. So at the moment, um, we are importing all of our energy from the grid. We're on a green tariff. Um, so arguably that's quite a, a green way to do it. But definitely uh, we're aware that there's a challenge there. And obviously it's not as green as generating our own power on site. And that's where we want to be as we go forward. So we're currently going through a bit of a feasibility exercise in terms of turbines. 
we're in a slightly difficult position that we're not a huge business. We're not anywhere near the size of Mackey's. So we're looking at a far smaller turbine um, to generate the power that we need. Somewhere beneath 500 kilowatts would be sufficient to generate most of the power we need. And if we could store that in a battery, that would probably mean we could be completely off grid. So we are looking at a part of the market which doesn't really exist for turbines at the moment because nobody has been building small turbines for the past couple of years. So um, we're looking at options there. One of the options is actually is potentially to have a, a second hand turbine from another site that's moved on to a larger turbine. And that then has further benefits that we're reusing technology that's been deployed elsewhere and giving that a, a second life. Um, so we're working out um, the carbon footprint of our crops based on, um, uh, on the energy that we're importing from the grid. Although we are a green tariff, I've put some, some uh, figures in there for how green the grid is uh, on a standard kind of metric. So the generation that goes into the grid in the north of Scotland is actually generally pretty green because it's so windy up here. So on average last year, um, the per kilowatt hour we're looking at 85 grams CO2 equivalent. So that's pretty low. Um, if you multiply that up though over a, um, over a facility like ours, it's still a significant footprint. But I have pulled out um, uh, a stat there in terms of strawberries, which is one of the crops that we can grow. We're not doing it at scale, but it's you know, just giving an example of something that could work in a facility like this. And I think that illustrates the benefit of trying to grow more locally rather than air freighting things in. So Scottish strawberries are grown in a polytunnel in Angus or Aberdeenshire through, through the summer have quite a low carbon footprint. But if you're then importing the equivalent crop from South Africa in January, February, you've got seven times higher carbon footprint to get that to your supermarket than if you were buying locally. Now, obviously you can't grow that locally in, in January, February, but where we fit in is that even if we're importing from the grid, which is a short-term measure for us before we go um, to our own generation, we are lower than the imported crops. So I think our starting position, even though we know there's room for improvement, I think is, is quite a good place to be. So um, in terms of how we achieve carbon neutrality going forwards. We have um, we've analyzed various parts of the business. Um, we're a very young business still in our infancy, so we're still going through that process and we'll continue to go through that process. Working with people like SRUC to look at our grow media. Um, we're looking at um, uh, obviously the electricity footprint. We're working with people like Pawprint to, look, to instill that um, a kind of understanding in our employees of what their personal carbon footprint looks like as well. Um, and we're looking at the, uh, the footprint of our build as well. So there could be some lessons learned there. So we've tried to make some efficiencies as, as we've gone. We've touched about things, touched on things like the chiller and so on as well. Um, so there's definitely some improvements to be made there and we'll continue to analyze that going forwards. Um, as with any business uh, and Jerry touched on this as well, although we will reduce our carbon footprint as far as we can, there are always going to be an element of things that will need to be offset. Um, we will always have some inputs, whether that, that's our grow media, um, things that we're building, you know, anything we build has a carbon footprint as well. So we'll be looking to, to minimise whatever we can and then offset. Um, the picture that's on the right there actually is, um, is a design for some new planting around the facility, the sheds. The building shown at the top of that picture are where our new facility is on our farm. And the blue and the green areas are new planting in what were formerly fields that were, were grazed and some of those have been cropped in the past. And those are slightly less productive areas on the farm. So what we're looking at doing is taking some of the areas where they might have had higher inputs to do arable crops in the past and just take those out of that form of production um, focus on the more productive areas and, um, and now plant trees in those other areas as well. We've got a mix of commercial and broadleaf trees there. So we've got some Sitka spruce, but it's mostly mostly native broadleaf, and that gives a really nice mix. Um, and then there's carbon sequestration on our farm, planted to a woodland carbon code standard, um, so that we can stand behind those credits and we know that they're, they're justifiably done. So that's a, a brief canter through our relatively new business and, and what we're hoping to do. And um, 